did Marcel Lefebvre make errors against the faith, against ecclesiology, excesses? And what are we to think of the critics of Lefebvre and the SSPX in the 1970s through till today? How do we evaluate these things with truth and charity? Today on the Guild Family Stream. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Sequila. This is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to the Guild Family Stream. This show is for you, Guild members who support the Apostolate. This is where we get into all the most controversial topics. And we have all of your comments and questions answered in the timely fashion, God willing. This week, the errors of Marcel Lefebvre, question mark, as a part of our series, St. John Paul II and St. Saint, Saint Marcel the Moderate. This is the Guild Family Stream. If you want the full show, you have to become a Guild member, support our apostolate, patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic or meaning of Catholic.com slash donate. As always, the views expressed on this show by me do not necessarily express the viewpoints of other members and hosts of the apostolate. So let's talk about our series here, St. John Paul II and St. Marcel the Moderate. This is an evaluation and a, 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 an investigation into these two figures who were fundamental in their own ways to defining and shaping the church in the so-called post-conciliar era after 1965. And what we are asserting here this is a, a, a an initiative that we're doing here to get past the superficial caricatures, whether that's a canonization caricature that sort of does not allow any criticism, which can be ascribed to either figure, or it's a demonization and a villainization of either character, either man, which is also superficial. I'm asserting in this in this series that both of those takes are superficial and they're not they're unjust, unjust to the facts. They're not really based on truth and charity. Here's our fundamental assertions in this whole series. The fundamental assertion is that it is reasonable to assert. It is reasonable to assert that Lefebvre and or Wojtyla, that's Pope John Paul II did great things for the good of the church. And it is also reasonable to assert that Lefebvre and or Lefebvre were guilty of grave errors and or excesses in prudence, which harmed the church. My assertions here are that these assertions are reasonable. They're reasonable. They're based on truth and charity. They're based on the, the ecclesiastical judgments given by not only the magisterial acts of the uh, Holy See, but also the acts of various bishops and respectable men of God whose opinions we should respect. And there's a third assertion, which we've already proved in a fully public series. And that assertion is that Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, vindicates the trads and Lefebvre on many fundamental points. That's the series, Pope Benedict vindicates the trads. That's... Um, I don't know how many parts it was, 10 or 12 or something. I can't remember. It was a lot of parts. But in that series, we presented the Steel case, Steel Man case, as far as I can tell, Steel Man case for the trad movement, essentially, by using Pope Benedict as a source. Basically, he's our only source, essentially, to justify the entire trad movement. So setting that aside, but that this whole series builds on that one. And especially after we get into the pontificate of John Paul II, which we'll get into after 1978, Ratzinger comes in as a key play dynamic between John Paul II and Archbishop Lefebvre. So here's the series so far. I predict that this whole series will probably be about 12, 13, or 14 episodes. Each of these are presentations of about an hour long. So this is the content that you can receive if you become a guild member. Uh, but just looking at where we're at here. So we've we've covered some of the principles of the judgment, number one, 
introduction to some of this stuff introduction cutting past one of the most common myths about john paul ii that he's that he was a fun uh the phenomenologist that's not correct and we d discussed that in two hours um and the last show we talked about marcella feb's greatness in terms of what he did for the church um especially in terms of the priesthood his society of saint pius x was not formed because uh saint pius x was the hammer of the modernists not that's not true actually it was because saint pius x was a pope of priests he was sort of a, a doctor of the priesthood and the claim which i think is a reasonable claim the reasonable claim is that archbishop lefebvre could be canonized one day and be called the doctor of the priesthood of the 20th century and we'll see why that is a little bit more today but we saw that on the last episode and in this episode we will talk about the errors of Marcel Lefebvre and I will make a case that he did make errors or excesses and I'll base this on a trad writer this is not based on a, a character assassination of Lefebvre which I think is going on to this day we'll talk about how it was happening in the 70s it's happening to this day it even as I said <clears throat> previously I think that the entry in the Catholic the new Catholic encyclopedia on Archbishop Lefebvre is woefully unjust um and it sort of follows that same misinformation about our of the uh, So we'll talk about that. So uh, so what we'll do is we'll do a parallel episode with Wojtyla up to 1978. So that'll be Carol Wojtyla, the greatness of Carol Wojtyla up to 1978. So when he was a priest in the 50s um, and then in the time up to his uh, being a bishop, becoming a bishop at Vatican II. And then he was a cardinal later on, cardinal of... Uh, Krakow. And we'll talk about the errors of Karl Wojtyla. What errors and excesses could we ascribe reasonably to Karl Wojtyla? Now, let me explain something real quick, I, something that I didn't really cover, I think, um, when I said that it's reasonable. What I mean by that is my research is preliminary on all these things. So I'm, I'm not prepared to die on any hill here. I'm not prepared to die on the hill that Lefebvre is a saint. I'm not prepared to die on the hill that John Paul II is, you know, the the great. I think that's reasonable based on the evidence. Certainly, I I definitely think that there there's a lot of just superficiality out there in terms of these two men, in terms of what people are saying, even in print, as I said. But I'm not ready to die on that hill because my really my research is preliminary. So once I have uh, ten more years of research, I might be willing to die on a hill but I don't have 10 years of research. I have about six months to 12 months of research on this topic. So, but after six to 12 months, I feel that I've already uncovered the fact that there's a pretty superficial take on these men. So that's why we're doing this series. Okay, let's continue. So here's my hypothesis, which we're definitely, we're especially we're going to test this hypothesis later on after 1978, which we'll get into uh, in parts 11, 12, 13 of this series. My hypothesis is that Ratzinger sympathized with Lefebvre, but ultimately misunderstood him like Michael Schmas, because Lefebvre's critique of Vatican II, the Novus Ordo, was imprecise. Okay, so in other words, Archbishop Lefebvre made some errors or excess in terms of his own ambiguity, and therefore Ratzinger did not ultimately understand him I think a, a big aspect of this is his history with Michael Schmoss. Michael Schmoss was one of his professors as a seminarian, Joseph Ratzinger. Michael Schmoss did not understand Ratzinger. He persecuted Ratzinger and also threatened his parents because of the way that he was treated. Marshall Schmoss didn't really treat him very well, unfortunately. And uh, Ratzinger did not take well to that. And he, he wrote about it decades later and still had a hard time with this sort of traumatic experience as a young seminarian. And it's, I think it's reasonable to hypothesize that when Ratzinger encountered Marcel Lefebvre, he probably thought that he was a similar man as Michael Schmoss. I think that's very reasonable. And there, I think there's a lot of similarities between Schmoss and Lefebvre, which we might get into here, but I, I would assert that Archbishop Lefebvre was an entirely different person and particularly 
Archbishop Lefebvre would define him most of all is that he was a father to the sheep. He was a shepherd to the sheep and he was willing to lay down his life for his sheep, right or wrong. Even if, even if he was committing an error, I think it's quite obvious that he did so out of uh, the love of a shepherd for his sheep and uh, a, a desire to fight against the wolves. And this is certainly a noble thing, even if one is making certain errors or excesses, I think, which we'll discuss. Now, it could also be another hypothesis, which might be even more. Um, well, I think the first one is the most probable, but the second one could be true as well. Ratzinger did have the courage or power, or I'm sorry, he did not have the courage or power to vindicate Lefebvre more than he did. This is based primarily on the witness of, of um, certain sources, which Micah Hickson has said, what Joseph Ratzinger said, that Archbishop Lefebvre was the greatest and most important bishop of the 20th century, something of it to that face so if that's the if that's correct if that's a correct uh report from joseph ratzinger then i think the second hypothesis would be more probable because that would mean that joseph ratzinger desired to totally vindicate lefebvre in other words he opposed the excommunication of 88 uh but he was unable to prevent it um people need to understand especially when we're judging you know when we're making comments about i, I still see this it's very sad because there's a presupposition of hyper papalism when people are criticizing rome for this or that failing to do this or that there's a presupposition of hyper papalism to say that you know say for example john paul ii saint john paul ii is criticized for his lack of action regarding um child sex abuse uh his lack of action regarding Marcia, marcial maciel uh some of this i think is justified especially maciel because he was given things directly he was told directly in person of some of this stuff so i think he he may bear responsibility in some sense but at the at the same time you got to understand the vatican bureaucracy the vatican bureaucracy is this wicked spiral of evil men who are manipulating and pulling strings all over the place and we see this all we got to do is go back to pius the 11th how do you think padre pio got condemned Padre Pio got condemned because there was a wicked Vatican bureaucracy manipulating Pius XI. Action Francaise. Why was that? Why was Action Francaise con condemned by Pius XI falsely? Why did he turn against the Cristeros? There was a massive bureaucracy already at work under Pius XI before World War II. So we can't necessarily ascribe every bad action or bad inaction uh that happens under a, any pontificate directly to that pope or to his his right hand man like people like joseph rasker now like i said some we can ascribe ascribe but we need just to be fair as much as we can again the principal charity unless we have bona fide evidence that something is the case against an individual we have to assume the best so let's continue so th that's my hypothesis that we'll be testing in this series, in, in the research that we're doing here. Okay. So here's an important piece of evidence that I just found recently. That's very interesting. Um, first of all, the, what people need to understand what the SSBX critics never seem to concede, which is very sad, which sort of reveals to me, to my mind, their bias, um, is that the SSBX was founded to form priests for the sacrifice of the mass according to the established and accepted norms pre-Vatican II, but with the explicit reference to Vatican II and the approval of the local, local bishop. So this is in 1970. The actual decree of the founding of the SCPX cited Vatican II. So the actual establishing of Vatican II itself is actually implementing Vatican II. And this is what people just fail to, fail to concede. And part of this, I think, is, an, is, is on Lefebvre's side, which is his own fault, which we'll discuss. But there just seems to be a, a total lack of acknowledgement, which is rather unjust, of these critics. Uh, when you read this history, in the, which is referenced here on the biography of Marcel Lefebvre, page 434, that's the where it says that the decree cited Vatican II. You can also read the open letter to confused Catholics, pages 56 to 66 where it talks about the new priesthood because essentially the founding chart of the SSPX was essentially what the FSSP is now. 
So we need to look at this in the proper light because we're going to talk today about how Marcel Lefebvre and the SSPX were received, where they were victimized by wicked men, especially in the French hierarchy. Uh, with, and that sort of mischaracterization is pr still propagated today by SSPX critics, and that's unjust. Again, you know, if you are a devotee of St. John Paul II, and I, I am, I am such a devotee. And if you follow St. John Paul II and you want his actions or inactions to be looked at in the proper light and you want him to be judged fairly, then you have to ex extend the same justice to Archbishop Lefebvre. Or if you are a follower of Archbishop Lefebvre and you are, you know, you attend an SSBX chapel or whatever, and you want Archbishop Lefebvre to get a fair day in court, then you have to extend the exact same justice to John Paul II. And I, I'm here to tell you that I, I'm sorry to say, but I, I've been reading the SSPX critique of John Paul II, and I find it very unjust. It's just an unjust critique. It's reading too much into John Paul II's words that it's finding heresy where there is none. And we'll talk about exactly where this cuts both ways today with Archbishop Lefebvre. Let's continue. So what's interesting here is that Pope Emeritus Benedict, in his book, From the Depths of Our Hearts, which was written with Cardinal Seurat, he makes an interesting concession here. This is on page 38. Quote, this is Pope Emeritus Benedict speaking. I, myse I myself, during a conference on priesthood in the church that was held immediately after the council, Vatican II, thought that I had to present the priest of the New Testament as the one who mediates on the word and not as a craftsman of worship, end quote. This is Joseph Ratzinger admitting that there was a serious crisis in the priesthood already immediately after the council. And we talked about this a little bit. This is coming especially out of the worker priest movement in France, which was heavily influenced, which was, it was good intention because it was an attempt to re-evangelize a secularized France where the priests were going out and they were getting jobs. So you had the priests working in the factory and whatnot, and they were trying to do that in order to uh, evangelize the atheist French workers. And Carol Wojtyla himself, when he went to France, he was inspired by this. He thought this was great, but he was naive as well, because I think this is the weakness of John Paul II, which we'll talk about, is that he was very savvy against the Soviet form of Marxism. He was very savvy. He fought the Nazis and the communists valiantly. But when it come, came to French Marxism and Western Marxism, he was not so savvy. He didn't, I, it seems like he didn't detect it as well as others did. Now, Archbishop Lefebvre did detect it, and he utterly rejected this, this Marxism, this French Marxism, um, because he was schooled in the old school French Catholicism from Action Française, which, as we said, was condemned by Pius XI falsely, a condemnation which was reversed by his successor, Pius XII, as one of the first acts of his pontificate. So um, let's continue. Aaron, what's up, brother? He says, love the sinner, hate the sin. Absolutely. That's St. Augustine. That's a, a fundamental principle of this, obviously. Um, here's the reality of the situation occasioned by Vatican II. Notice I'm not saying that Vatican II taught this, but it, it no one could deny that it was occasioned historically by Vatican II. The new seminarians were swallowed up by the Marxist influence worker priests and the heresy of activism occasioned by the Novus Ordo. Again, the Novus Ordo does not technically teach this, but no one can deny if you look at the text that it is more susceptible to Marxism, especially if you, and Joseph Ratzinger himself writes about this in Spirit of the Liturgy and in Milestones, where he talks about how the liturgy has been, has disintegrated into this worship in, of the cult of man, and it's a lack of the sacrifice, the sacrifice of the cross, in which is so beautifully represented in the, in the old rite. And that's why the Latin mass just draws priests because it's the sacrifice. Now, I, I note also 
this is something also that SSPX critics seem to never concede, which is, again, seems to reveal their bias, is that there were two apostolic visitations of Archbishop of Fab, one of the 70s and one of the 80s. They were both favorable. Cardinal Gagnon, which was the most, he was the most trusted, trusted man in the Vatican by, by uh, Paul VI. Okay. So cons just consider, you have to consider this source that I'm, I'm quoting here. I'm quoting the most trusted man in the Vatican in the 1970s, Cardinal Gagnon, who was entrusted by Paul VI to investigate the Curia for the Masonic infiltration, et cetera, et cetera. That's all, that's all documented in um, this book. Murder in the 33rd degree by an eyewitness to these events, Charles Murr, who's still living. Cardinal Gagnon was the most trusted man under Paul VI. And then he became another trusted man under John Paul II. And it was him that John Paul II entrusted the visitation in the 1980s. And that's this is one of the reasons why we can take the ecclesiastical judgment of 1988 with a grain of salt and consider... Uh, yes, the words written against Marcel Lefebvre were severe in 1988, and we'll talk about 1976 as well. They were defined as a schismatic act, but we need to take that in tandem with the judgment of Cardinal Gagnon, which was entirely favorably. Cardinal Gagnon said that Marcel Lefebvre was a man of God who was doing the right thing. He said that his seminary is a model seminary for the whole world. And that was in 1987. Well, guess what? The visitators under Paul VI also gave a favorable report. And those guys, we know, were more or less liberal heretics who were doubting the resurrection. Even they were given a favorable report. So I find it very unjust when there is this mischaracterization of Archbishop Lefebvre as this rebellious guy who's setting up this whole thing in the 70s and 80s in order to rebel against the Holy See. Now we'll talk about why some of the stuff he said, I think played into that. But if we're if we're being sympathetic, again, we gotta be fair to John Paul II and fair to Archbishop Lefebvre under the same judgment. I think it's, it, it, nobody can really knock Lefebvre, especially if we consider these, these considerations of uh, Cardinal Gagnon and the visitators. So, you know, if you if you say you follow magisterium, you say you trust the Holy See. And, but all you do is cherry pick these, you know, Ecclesia Dei Ad Flicita, which is out of date, by the way. And you cherry pick these things. You're not looking at the depth of the issue and all the different aspects of this. Uh, last thing we'll do before we in, in the public portion of this show is we'll talk about Lefebvre's great good for the church. One, again. I'm going to make the case that he made errors and excesses in just a minute based on Henry Sear. But we can't deny at the same time that he fought like a bishop against widespread heresies. He supported the charitable anathema from 1966. This is something that almost no bishops did, but it's the way that bishops should act. Did he make errors? Yes, I think he did. Well, I'll discuss that. But did he fight like a bishop? Yes, he fought like a bishop. He forced the magisterium to allow the TLM, even though Ratzinger would have done it anyway. He forced the magisterium to clarify the doctrinal weight of Vatican II, which, at least under Paul VI, was not, it's not forthcoming at all, which was very problematic theologically. Um, overall, I, I do, my impression, I haven't studied it again. This is preliminary. I have not, I have not studied it Um. I, I'm not really that impressed by the SSBS critique of Vatican II. I think it's theologically imprecise. Um, but based on doing these critiques is what forced the magisterium to clarify a lot of these things. And this is exactly the dynamic that is described by Joseph Ratzker and Donum Veritatis, is that there, there needs to be a fruitful dialogue, but this dialogue broke down I think mostly due to a character, a character assassination, but I think the blame can also go back to Lefebvre as well to a degree. Um, final, uh, final slide here for the public portion, and then we're going to close it out and we'll get into the errors and excesses 
in the private show. So if you want access to that, you need to become a guild member. Let's see. Here's our, we'll get into, here's all our sections that we'll go over in the guild stream. Uh, but here's the reasonable assertions of fact. An Aryan theologian acting in good faith can be a misinformed shepherd who still lays down his life for his sheep. This is what I will argue is reasonable to assert regarding Archbishop Lefebvre. Versus an Aryan theologian acting in bad faith is a wolf and a hireling scattering the sheep. So there's a big difference between making error in good faith. Hey, I'm trying my best. I've been misinformed, something like that. But I'm trying to be a bishop. Well, I think that's definitely what, Archb at the very least, we can say about Archbishop Lefebvre. Uh, number two, the French wolves created a characterization of uh, assassination of Lefebvre based on the calumny since the 1970s, which continues to this day. Um, when Archbishop Lefebvre was finally given an audience with Paul VI in 1976. He had been trying to have an audience with Paul VI since 1974. Two years trying to get an audience with the Pope. Because of Cardinal Villot, whom we know was at least an enemy of the faith, if not a Freemason, based on the testimony, again, of Charles Murr, inside source, reliable person. He was the Cardinal, you know, remember, this is for, coming from Cardinal Gagnon, the most trusted man of Paul VI. Through him and his secretary, they're asserting that Cardinal Vio was a Freemason. This is not just some conspiracy theory that you guys, you know, you talking to the, the critics of the trads, you can just dismiss and throw out because we're crazy or something. No, it, I'm talking about these true sources. These are these reliable sources. Look at look into the sources. I've got all my sources out here. Um, <clears throat> so we know that when Archbishop Lefebvre was finally given an audience in 1976, Paul VI believed that Archbishop Lefebvre was telling all of his seminarians to swear an oath against the Pope. Okay, so Paul VI believed that Archbishop Lefebvre was telling all his seminarians to swear an oath against the Pope, which was a, a complete calumny, total lie. And Archbishop Lefebvre was flabbergasted. He said, according to his own count, he said, Holy Father, what on earth? Where did you get that? You know, he was just flabbergasted. And he writes later, he thought, he thought maybe they misunderstood what the anti-modernist oath is because they were taking the anti-modernist oath, but it wasn't an oath against the Pope. That's insane. But these are the types of character assassinations that were being manipulated in the ear, you have this worm tongue situation where Paul the Six is getting um, these lies fed to him by these men that he trusts, which are actually enemies of the faith. Vo is his Secretary of State; he's like the number two or three man in the entire Vatican. Vo and Vo was a terrible enemy, according to Cardinal Gagnon. So we have this character assassination going on. Um, and we also know that the post-Vatican II popes treated the wolves with gentleness. So the wolves were treated with a slap on the hand who were destroying the faith of little children. People like Hans Kuhn. He got a slap on the hand. Hans Kuhn got a little slap. Say, hey, hey, you're a wolf destroying the, destroying the faith of little children, corrupting and spreading heresy, undermining dogmas of the faith like papal infallibility. Skilibex, Dutch bishops, Dutch bishops, you're you're under Dutch bishops are preaching, uh, undermining the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. Slap on the hand. But Archbishop Lefebvre, who, as I will argue in just a minute, I think he did make errors and excesses, but he was fighting for the basic dogmas of Trent. He gets the smackdown. Now. I'm not a theologian. I'm just a layman. I'm a father trying to teach my children the faith. I think that's a little unfair, don't you? I think that's unreasonable. So let's talk about the errors and excesses of Archbishop Lefebvre. Um, this is according to, again, these are according to, mostly according to Henry Sear. This is a traditionalist writer who is, he, he writes his criticisms of Archbishop Lefebvre actually in a section in which he praises he praises Archbishop Lefebvre as a witness, a trad godfather, basically. But he has certain criticisms. So followers of Lefebvre, fear not. We need to 
be honest and say, well, maybe Lefebvre did make some excesses. At least, at least admit that it's reasonable. It's not, you know, it's not because I hate Lefebvre or Henry Sear hates Lefebvre. It's quite the opposite. But just because, you know, I, again, I'm going to say the same thing about John Ball too. I am going to claim that it's reasonable to say that Carol Vatiwa made errors. He was naive about the, the French market Marxist priest. He seems to have been naive about the uh, Alfred Kinsey and the pseudoscience of the 1950s. He seems to, you know, if you read Love, Love and Responsibility. And these are very, very serious problems that we'll discuss all about in John Paul II. But that doesn't diminish the fact that, you know, a man can do great good and do some errors or excesses. But I'm arguing that I think we can look past some of these excesses especially if the ecclesiastical judgment has not pinpointed those. And that's one of the key things about Lefebvre is that his errors have not been condemned. This is the key point, is that when you condemn a man for, especially, you know, especially posthumously, I mean, even if he was, there were, were to be found an error in him, uh, they need to be condemned and refuted and shown to be an error as the magisterium does. That's the way that the magisterium works according to uh, justice for that individual. Like think about Martin Luther, all of his errors were listed. They were condemned and he was given time to repent. Archbishop Lefebvre didn't even get the treatment of Martin Luther. He got a worse treatment than Martin Luther. So this is the, this is the, uh, the problem here. So that's the end of the public portion. We'll get into the errors and excesses of March Archbishop Lefebvre in the whole Guild family stream. If you want access to that, patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic or meaning of Catholic.com slash donate.